You're listening to Rain It In with Ash and Josh. What a clap. Oh, no. We don't have a snapper board. We just have <laughs> me. <laughs> it works all the same. We got, oh, we're all printed out. It's yeah, so professional. I'm actually very impressed. Thank you. We don't look as organised and then people see us and like oh that actually is we are yeah, fairly you know, you know mm. what you're doing yeah just about anyway well we're getting there we've got an <laughs> intro for you rosie okay i'm okay. nervous welcome back to the rain it in with ash and josh podcast today we are have an absolute pleasure of a guest with us it's rosie tapner a former top model turn tv presenter with a true passion for horses Rosie has graced the covers of Vogue and worked as a model for a decade before focusing on equestrian presenting. From prestigious UK events like Ascot and Cheltenham to international appearance in Courtois and Saudi Arabia, Rosie has captivated audiences with her knowledge and love for horses. Join us as we delve into Rosie's remarkable journey and her unwavering dedication to the equestrian community. An intro, guys. A really good intro. <laughs> That's so um, sweet. Apart from your pronunciation of. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I've practiced that before. I, I was going to say, I was going to say, before you Qatar. came, before <laughs> Qatar, before you Qatar. came, Josh said, uh, let me just read the intro to you and tell me what you think. And he started reading it and he got to that point and he said, Courtois. And he went, and I, I said, what, what Do you know you why say? I say that? It's because it's a clothing brand. brand. Oh, I yeah. just always go to it the clothing brand. Laugh. I was like, and even so, you, you pronounce the clothing brand. It's, it's couture. Couture. You did pretty well, though. Otherwise, yeah, it was I, really I, good. Yeah, yeah. I thought you did really well. It mate. was really I, um, good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rosie, Rosie Tatler. Well, to be honest, it's better than the international one with Ellie McCarthy. <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah, I did hear that one. I, yeah, 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 that was classic as yeah, well. I, I, I think it's your that. thing. Just botch the, the, botch the, the intros. intros. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think one day we will just get better. Well, what we'll do is we'll have someone to come on and just do the intros for no, us. Yeah, it makes then, it more chilled. I like it. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. It, it settles everyone in. It does. Ladies and gentlemen, Rosie Tatner. I'm very happy to finally have this opportunity to sit down with you because we've worked with each other. We've known each other now for a small while. And um, in terms of working with people, you are generally one of the nicest people we've had the pleasure of working with. Oh, um, and people, um, I assume, if they've not been living under a rock, will have seen you uh, doing your presenting, interviewing on globals, um, race days, etc. cetera. Um, and I think it's a really good opportunity for you to be talked to and interviewed and people to get to know who is the interviewer. Um, so let's start with Rosie Tapner. Where did you come from? Where's your background? Let people know a little bit more about you. This is when I falter because being is this in the media is really scary. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, I was brought up in Hertfordshire, uh, very much a country girl. Uh, horses, dogs, everything just need my animals in life, need nothing else. Much prefer my animals to humans, oddly. Um, but, sorry, guys. Most, most equestrians do. <laughs> most equestrians do, exactly. Um, and just, yeah, very country girl. And then when I was 15, I was scouted at the clothes show in Birmingham, which our school took us to. And I did kick up a huge fuss about going to this. Um, and they said, well, everyone in the school is going, so we can't leave you behind. So you slightly need to come. And I went in my dungarees and my riding boots and got scouted five times, I believe. And we, when we got home, mum and I just said, well, why don't we just pop into one of the agencies and just see what happens? Mm. And then about a week later, I was in New York shooting for Balenciaga. So it went from absolutely nothing to everything, men, everything all at one time. So what age was that that you went and did that, that journey started? Just 15, just. Wow. Yeah, and now I look back on it, I'm like who the hell manages to be 15 and travel six days a week and how do you explain you know. that to your friends do you know what i think well my friends might say differently i was uh i tried my best not to really talk about it so i would be away a lot from school during gcse's and everything i was traveling six days a week at one point and trying to sort of do school work and i'd come back and forth um and I think to most of my friends, when they said, oh, how was your day? And if I'd had a really cool day, I'd just go, oh, it was a good day. And then to my best friends, they'd then come in. Well, I was at boarding school. They'd come into my room and then say, OK, so now how was your day? And then I could spill sort of the yeah. people that I've mm. met and how cool my day was. But I was trying to keep it low key so that people didn't get jealous and get stressed mm. about it. But yeah, it's tricky. Did you enjoy it? Um... Ooh, loaded question. Did I enjoy it? Uh, 
parts of it. I think the way I'd explain it is that there were some days that were the most epic days ever and seriously enjoyable. But if I compared them to a day riding or at home walking the dogs, that would still be more fun than a day at work. But it was a day at work. You know, that's the other mm. thing. It's it's hard. Like, I think people think the fashion industry is glamorous and really fun. And it's absolutely not. You know, you're told you're fat every day. You're in shoots for 14 to 16 hours, if not more. It is they're long, long days. I was very lucky that I sort of went quite high up to the top quite quickly. So I was looked after really, really well. But even so, you know, you do have incredibly long hours which I think now really helps me with presenting because lots of people say oh this is a long long job and I'm like mm, nothing compared to what I used no, to do and no. I'm allowed to eat so <laughs> it's even better <laughs> what was one of your most sort of memorable moments from the shoots that you've done oh so many actually um I think one of the funniest ones is I went to Miami for 24 hours, came back for 24 hours and then went back out for another 24 hours. And when we went out there the first time, I think it was Vogue the first time. And we were in Miami and like we were right by the beach and it was a really cool background. And they shot us against a white wall. <laughs> Just thought, um, I've come all the way to Miami and we're shooting against a white wall. Um, which wasn't the original plan, but then it did turn into the plan. Um, and then I was desperate to go home and play my... Uh, I played lacrosse at school. I was posh lacrosse. Uh, and so I was desperate to go back and play my match. So I got a flight home and then went back out to shoot Top Shop, which we then were shooting in the on the beach and in the sea, which... Uh, they fake tanned me in the morning because I'm so pale. <laughs> country bumpkin <laughs> country for bumpkin. England. And because I never really, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm a bit all over the place. And so I ran into the sea to do a bit of the shoot. <laughs> and the makeup artist just screaming at me as she sees all the fake tan stuff <laughs> streak. <laughs> I was, I was so sorry I'm not elegant um, but you know they'd be like and then we had there were pull up bars I remember this so well there were pull up bars they're like oh girls can you just like hang on them or something because it'd be quite funny and I just started doing pull ups <laughs> got really sweaty <laughs> just, like no maybe just maybe just be like a model casting director of Vogue is there kind of like why what what's our done? thought process behind <laughs> casting her it in this was campaign? really odd though because I you know I would sit there with my with my GCSE books and try and revise while at her makeup up was being done and then I'd be thinking about when do I get to ride when do I get to go home so it was an odd one I did really I do look back on it and think sort of type two fun when you're in it it's quite tricky but when you're out of it I do think that I would never go back and not do it it was yeah. incredibly hard and there were times that were absolutely awful but at the same time it's given me so much so I would never knock it mm -hmm. because it is a tough industry but it's given me so much more do you think it um like pushed you in the direction for your love for horses and the countryside at all yeah I just wanted to get home I honestly there were times where they'd say oh you've got an option on this job and that job and then as soon as that job got cancelled or didn't I didn't get accepted I'd be thrilled yeah. <laughs> like yes I've got an extra day at school or an extra day at home riding and like thank god I've got mum at home because she was amazing and looked after all the horses for us when we were away so we were very lucky to have that set up at home as well so I could just come back and jump on a ride I mean we weren't serious riders at all we would just have fun and go for a ride but it was yeah I mean all the time that I was away all I thought about was being home I want to be at home you almost have to be away from something to realize how much you love it so true what um point was it then that you really went away from that industry and went nah this is the crossroads I think there were quite a few times that I tried to get out of it and then <sighs> I would ha hate to say my ego because I hope I don't really have a huge amount of one. But I think there is a time that... So I used to walk into a room and everyone would go, oh, there's that model, which I hated. But then the thought of that not being a thing, I was also like, oh, don't really like that. But, you know, you'd have awful times. You'd walk into a room and they'd go, oh, there's that model. And then I'd overhear them go, oh, she must be photoshopped a lot because she's not like that in real life. Or she looks a bit chubby or she looks a bit this. So I'd go like, oh, God, I'm being compared all the time. Yeah. Um but there was just, I think it was lockdown actually that, so I was still with my agency, but I was sort of, I was basically done. It all just slowed down really. Uh, just cause I wasn't small enough anymore. I didn't enjoy it anymore. And in lockdown, I just decided, I think that's it now. Presenting had sort of just started out and I sent an email to the agency just saying I'm done. 
And I actually was on the phone to my best friend. I was FaceTiming her and I said, I really need to send this email, but I'm absolutely petrified because this is 10 years of my life that I'm now just yeah, ending. Yeah, it's a big change. And she said, go and get yourself a massive slice of cake. Sit there and I want you to send the email and then I want you to eat that slice of cake without feeling any sort of guilt at all. Because I mm. never had any disorders, but I definitely ate and then got cross with myself for eating because I knew I had to shoot the next day. So I did that and I sent the email and then I ate that slice of cake and it genuinely was the first time in 10 years that I ate without guilt. And I, I literally was like, I cannot believe that I don't need to worry about that. So it was, yeah, it was a good moment that, that It must that be <laughs> crazy that, you, again, similar to you don't realise how much you love for it until, you, until you're away from it, similar to that like metaphorical cake slices, you probably didn't realise for so long that effect it had on you until you was away from it and gone, this is the goddamn best slice of cake I've ever had in my life. It actually was as well. It was such a good slice of cake. <laughs> but it's so true. It is one of those things that, you know, you don't realise that it was actually holding quite a s strong hold on you. And then when it was gone, I just had no stress about it at all. And I do get asked to do shoots now. And I just, most of the time I say no to certain people, I'll, I'll do it. But it's, you know, we did a charity shoot for brain tumor research, which was amazing. It was all for the hats and the milliners. Um, and it was such a lovely shoot to do. But at the same time, the two weeks before it, I stressed for two weeks about what I looked like, what I was eating. And it's just that trigger of, oh my God, I'm going on a shoot. And they were they couldn't have been nicer. And they, I gave them my size, so I knew everything would fit. Yeah. But it's still that stress of, oh my God, I'm on a shoot. But then having said that, when I was in front of the camera, sort of, in, I think I enjoyed being in front of the camera, but the rest of it, I didn't enjoy. I liked pretending I was a model for the day. Um, taking it back slightly, and you spoke about how you entered a room and people would talk about your appearance. If you were doing modeling now and you were 16 and you're growing up and you had social media, which is way more prevalent Ooh, than yeah. 10 years ago, how do you think that would have affected your modeling career? Um, I feel really sorry for anyone growing up with social media because I think, I just think it's impossible to grow up and not worry about what you look like anymore. And I only worried because of what I was told at work and I had to fit into clothes and everything. I never worried, you know, when people said, oh, she looks like she needs to be photoshopped or something. I just thought, well, good for you. <laughs> you know, if yeah. you want to be like that, that's fine. Um, I think social media is incredibly dangerous and younger girls look at other people. You know, I even had it at school. Younger girls would look at me and say, oh, you know, I, she clearly doesn't eat. She must you know, we must do the same to the point that I then went to start having breakfast with the younger girls and lunch with the younger girls uh, just to prove that I did eat. Because I, I mean, I ate loads until you then start telling, you know, I had a job to do. So I also couldn't eat too much. But I would just purposely go and sit with them and say, you're 11 years old. You can eat mm. what, like I'd give anything to go back to being 10, 11 when you just don't care. Mm. But I just think nowadays 10, 11 year olds do care because of social media and what they see. Yeah. And that's why when I post things, hopefully I do, I mean, I've never edited myself. I've never photoshopped. In fact, on one shoot, there was a girl that was much smaller than me. And they even said to me, oh, we'll photoshop Rosie's arms to look like her because I have muscle. And I turned around to them and I went, you definitely won't be doing that. Mm. Um, so I just say it is a really dangerous world, social media. And I think everyone needs to learn to take it with a pinch of salt. And, you know, I've sort of come up with a mantra in life, which is who cares? And I've said to quite a few younger girls, I don't know if this applies to boys, but let me know if it does. Because I think my sort of thought with it is if you're on a beach in your bikini or your trunks and you're with a group of good friends, but you've all got phones and you've all got cameras, would you run around that beach all day and have the best time ever? I think my answer would probably be no, because I'd be worried that people were taking pictures and worried that people might chuck it up on social media without asking. And then I thought if you go to the same beach, same bikini, same swim trunks, whatever, and no one had cameras, no one had phones, would you actually care? Mm. Probably not, because no. it's not going out online and people will forget about it because people genuinely don't care about it at all. And so that's sort of my new mantra in life is just, oh, who cares? Mm. And it's so much, and it is, you know, I don't like walking into a room of people if you're late because I'm thinking, oh, everyone's looking at you when you're, you don't turn up late. And now yeah. I just say to myself 10 times, who cares? And just walk in and think, oh, if they care, that's their problem, not mine. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I'd say to people growing up is just it's a good mentality to have. Yeah, just stop caring. It's yeah. So much easier in it's life. Also just a have really fun. Difficult mentality to adopt. It's taken it ten takes, years. Yeah, yeah, hundred <laughs> really percent. Like I, I, I've been like that with social media. We've both had our ups and downs of social media, and I've only recently just 
come back off holiday and similar to you I was I was on the beach and I was just like I just don't need to take any photos I, I, I you take the odd things but they're like personal photos yeah you don't need and to share everything yeah I, I'm just sitting there and it's the first time just even a week away from my phone how much I come back recharged and how much you realise that you don't need to share I mean we all share everything but we actually don't share everything people think that you share your whole life you really don't you know, I share if I went for a run yesterday and a swim, but I don't share that every day. I do that every day, but I don't share it every day. Mm. And you do. We went to the Azores last year for 10 days and my fiance and I said, let's just no phones. We'll take pictures, but nothing else, not social media. And we didn't until the last day. And it was just so nice. I just thought no one actually cares what we've done on holiday. So why why post it? Particularly nowadays when you know, the way the world is, I don't think people really want to see that you're on holiday. Mm. I think life's quite tough at the moment. So mm. why do you want to see that someone's on a on a nice holiday? Yeah. Do you think your upbringing helped you deal with the modelling world? Yeah, massively so. Mum and dad were amazing at not caring. And that sounds awful, mm. <laughs> but they just didn't, you know, I was on billboards, I was on buses, there were, it was all over the place. And they never, not in a nasty way, they were always very proud and always said well done and always took a huge interest. But they also, when other people were around, would not scream and shout about it. They wouldn't, you know, be all over it. They wouldn't care that much about it. To me, they would. And, you know, made me realise that they were happy with what I was doing. But then the flip side of it, they just didn't care. Mm. I remember we pulled up to a bus and there was, I was on it. Which is really that. weird. Um, and mum just looked at him and was like, oh, that's nice. And I was like, oh, that's so, you know, at the time I was probably going, oh, mm. come on, a bit more. Now I appreciate it so much because it mm. is just, they are so proud. They are amazing at being proud of everyone in the family. But they also are very good at making sure that n no one has like a better... Keeps you like humility. Yeah, no, completely. Keeps just you chuck grounded, you down on the ground. But I think horses do that as well. Yes. You know, you're on an amazing shoot and then you come home and you get chucked off a horse. <laughs> you're like, yeah, back with a bang, guys. <laughs> Have you ever been on a, a shoot where you've had to model with a horse? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was interesting. <laughs> we were in, oh, I think we we're in the south of France um, and they had sedated this horse, even though I had said, you know, very kindly, humanely sedated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had said for days before, I can ride yeah. like I really can ride and they sedated this horse and um they wanted me to go in the sea with it and he would not budge into the sea was really freaked out by it and the owner said oh well, I'll get on you clearly don't know what you're doing and she jumped on and the horse just bucked and galloped off no. and I thought yeah <laughs> karma. Karma. <laughs> absolute karma and then I jumped back on and we just went around the beach um on this horse and that was it was an amazing thing to do I've had to sit on a polo pony before um again and I think we were in Paris just outside of Paris uh that was a whole different experience because I've never sat on a polo pony before and you move your reins and they're gone really so, <laughs> so they're just trained a whole different way to a normal horse so yeah I've definitely we did one shoot at home I think it was my second ever shoot um used my sister's horse jumped on him in the field bareback and he galloped off and <laughs> threw me off on the concrete it was good oh, but if I'm you know we're like we're tough girls and tough guys when yeah. we're we're horse riders so yeah. I just jumped back on and carried on and the the photographer's like you okay <laughs> I was like fine it's fine it doesn't matter this is normal <laughs> it's fine but I think that puts you in good stead the amount of shoots that I've um being the one to be put in the sort of more dangerous positions. Like mm. I had to stand on top of a combine harvester when it was very, very windy in nine inch heels and a dress I couldn't breathe in. And they had someone like behind me lying down just in case I fell. They even like started phoning the hospital just to be like, just in case she falls. Oh, <laughs> and I was like, God. don't worry guys, it'll be fine. Cause I was just always up for it. I was like, come on, if we're going to do something, I'd rather do it properly. Yeah, equestrian girls, country girls are some of like the most ballsiest women you can find. We just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> we just don't care. It's an odd one. How did you then transition into TV presenting? So I think, I guess I had a somewhat of a profile from modelling. And because of that, I got asked to do the Magnolia Cup at Goodwood charity race, which they do every year. It's an all women charity race. Um, and they raise money for different charities each year. And I got asked to do that. And I knew my agency would probably say no to it. So I signed the contract to do it. And then I told them. <laughs> um, and I did that race. And that, that changed my whole life because that went from, I had trained to be skinny my whole life. And then suddenly you have to pass the jockey fitness test, which is 
insane. And I had to get fit and I was in the gym lifting weights. I was getting up at four o'clock in the morning, riding four, four horses out every morning, then going home and lifting weights for an hour and walking the dogs. I was really, really on it. And for the first time in my life, I got strong. I got fit. I was actually probably the smallest I've been, but the heaviest I've been and that felt unreal. And I just thought, yeah, this is this is now what I want to do. And then I did another charity race at Ascot three months later. And I just networked. I told everyone that I wanted to tell that I wanted to be a presenter. And I had done since I was tiny. And modelling was never um, something I'd ever wanted to go into. And the commercial director at the time tapped me on the shoulder at Ascot over lunch. And she said, I've just heard that you want to be a presenter. And I need a new one for Royal Ascot. I need a fashion presenter. And in my head, I was like, I don't want to be a fashion presenter. But I didn't say that. I thought, brilliant. Toe through the door. Um learned as much as I could about racing. I mean, we're talking just the names of the favourite horses. Mm. So when I threw back to people, I could say, oh, you know, we've got group one coming up and Batash is the favourite or something. Mm. And then they said, oh, do you like your racing? And I said, yep. And then they said, be our racing presenter. And that's sort of how it then evolved. And I I love researching. So I like knowing about new things and I like learning about new things. And I'm also never sort of under the assumption that I know everything as well so a lot of people in the industry have helped me get to where get to where it's gone who would you say has played the biggest part (laughs) who do you want to upset (laughs) no no the question is who do you want to upset (laughs) um I think almost too many people to mention um lots of people from the I mean the whole ITV racing team I'm not on ITV racing but they have been incredible like behind the scenes they've let me come for the day and watch them in the truck and ed chamberlain's been hugely to my help and my lovely manager liz has been incredible nick luck's been amazing michelle you's been like there have been just too many people along the way that have been very kind and you know there are so many people that could very easily look at me and go oh there's a new girl coming up let's be nasty to her Mm. and yet every single one of them has helped me and looked after me and yeah, I couldn't be more grateful to to all of them for because it is like a little dream come true that this is actually happening. What are some of the unique challenges and well, I guess positive things that have happened from you while you've been presenting on TV? It's just been the best fun ever. <laughs> it's yeah. literally yeah. been, I think at the moment, challenges wise, it's just making sure you know your stuff, turning up prepared. But for me at the moment, it is still, I think this is probably my second full time year, thanks to COVID. And I just, I am loving every single second. I'm used to long hours, so that doesn't really bother me. The one thing I really can't do is the heat. <laughs> so we went to Saudi at the beginning of the year. That was hot. Yeah. And all day, or we were working with local cameramen who couldn't really speak English. And um, I was very lucky I got to wear the traditional dress as well. But it, That's is, so cool. it was yeah. very cool. That's I love so embracing cool. yeah. where you are. Love a bit of different culture. But it's love hot. It. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think I lost a good amount of weight just in sweat that week. <laughs> Um, but I'm just that's yeah I'm not good at heat that's probably my biggest Mm. challenge we were in Rome last week for the Global Champs Tour um, which is a new job that's just come through which is really exciting and the whole time all I did was go it's too hot it's just too hot I can't do it Um, I'm pathetic at the heat yeah I'm I'm exactly the same what uh, is the um, skills you've had to develop from doing that because modelling and presenting are two completely different things totally different things I think the one help though is that I was really comfortable in front of a camera so I didn't care care I don't care about the camera I don't tend to look at it the nice thing is I really don't care what I look like anymore which is really a lot of people have said to me you know when you're on camera now do you still think about what you look like I'm like no I think about what I say and I think the skills I've had to learn which Ed Chamberlain and Richard Hoyles have been a massive help with is they said I'm too nice So I've had to... On camera or off camera? On. (laughs) So there'll be some interviews that you do need to kind of be a bit more... Like press a little bit. Yeah, punchy with it. And I I think my first race day ever, it was one of the smallest race days. And I was like, this is so exciting. This is just the best day ever. And every every jockey that won, I'd go like, brilliant, well done. (laughs) It'd be a really rubbish race. (laughs) And uh, so I just, I've had to really learn to actually like think about it a bit more and change the tone of my voice to what the scenario is. That's yeah. probably been my hardest thing so far that I actually have had to learn and kind of get the skills to go, okay, it's been a it's been a good day, but it's not been 
the best day. But yeah, Ed and Richard and Liz have been the hilarious ones, yeah. with that because they'll watch stuff back and they'll go, Rosie, was that actually exciting? I'm like, no. <laughs> but then on the flip side of that, I think it's also a good skill to have to be constantly enthusiastic because it's, it's really hard. A good revival, I wasn't, I know nothing about cars, but we were doing, I was doing all the behind the scenes stuff. So I was going on the merry-go-round and the Helter Skelter and all the mm. crazy things. And so I had the energy to be able to make that hopefully a bit more enjoyable. Yeah. Um, but I genuinely am just enthusiastic and love it. Everyone thinks I have 10 coffees. I can't have coffee. I'll explode if I have coffee. I can imagine you exploding if yeah. you had coffee. No, I can't yeah. do coffee. I had it once at school and I was sent uh, I sent out the lesson and told to go for a run. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do coffee. I've never scored so many goals in my life when I had coffee that day. And across. Oh my God. Even my teacher's like, what happened to you that day? I was like... I dipped some biscuits in coffee today instead of hot chocolate because oh I've given God. up chocolate. <laughs> That's all. That is, yeah, stay away from Can't caffeine coffee. altogether. No, 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 no. I had a, um, uh, a new appreciation when I spoke to you last um, about, and it makes sense now with your uh, temperament and personality, how you are able to do the job at the level you do. And we were talking about, because we were telling you that oh, we, had, we had Ollie Fletcher coming on and it was literally just after GCT and you were saying about how you have to, it's so on the ball. I've got to get them. Then you've got to ask them a question and then you're looking at who's gone in and then you've got to try and find them. It's not just the presenting. No. It is the organization and the quick, and we have it sometimes, don't we? When mm. we get, we work at brands and we get like almost like a content list and you're like, right, have we got this? And you've almost got to remember that you are sometimes the presenter, the director, yep. the, the floor the manager, the yeah. cam language. And it's the whole thing is, it's a whole it's a whole big production of it. hundred percent. You don't it depends on what job you're on, obviously. So at Burley I had the most amazing floor manager, Morgan, who has just started out and honestly you'd think she'd been working in the industry for twenty years. She is amazing. And so she would go and get the riders for me and all I had to actually do was ask the questions. Global Champs Tour and actually most other jobs I never have a floor manager. Um Global Champs, they're amazing. They'll always try and help when they can, but it is busy. Um, so yeah, like you said, you'll be interviewing someone and also listening in your ear as to if the next person's going clear and then they like to cool down their horses quite rightly. And so then you're watching them in the warm down going, can you come over for an interview? And so it is a juggle, but I love the juggle. I really dislike a day at work when it's not busy because yeah. I, I feel like you're then not needed. I feel like you're uh, sort of a spare part. I much prefer a day when you are on the go and it's a bit manic because you get to the end of the day and you go oh yeah like smashed it like did it really well something. you feel like you've achieved something and plus you are i never understand people that go to work and complain about having to work because i think you're being paid to work a it's my dream job so i'm never going to complain doesn't feel like a job it doesn't feel like a job but b you're being paid so do the job you're being paid for and then cry when you get home that was my motto when i was a model is, you know, my first ever job, they cut all my hair off, made it uneven and chucked a fringe in. And on the very, actual... Very vogue. Really vogue. <laughs> um, and yeah, that was Bled Siaga, actually. And they made... they on It looked awful. But on the shoot all day, I was going, oh, I love it. I feel like a rock star. This is amazing. I love my haircut. Thank you so much. Got in the car back with my agent, burst into tears. I was like, what the hell have they done to my hair? And it took ages to grow out. And But, you know, when you're on a job you get on with it. Like have the attitude just to get on with life. Not everything's going to be perfect. You're not going to love everything, but just get on with it. Life's so much more fun if you just keep going. Mm. That's what I found. After recently working with GCT this year, what has surprised you about that show? I just didn't realise how big it was. I am so excited. So I'm going to Prague and Saudi with them. Uh, well, Saudi in a few weeks time and then Prague at the end of the year. And then very luckily I've been asked to do quite a few of the weekends next year. I didn't realise how big of a competition it was, which is probably very naive of me. Um, and I'm now completely obsessed with the competition. <laughs> and really, it's something about show jumping and a bit like eventing as well. You know, it's it's not just a one day thing or a one race thing. It, it keeps going. And I love the fact that competition goes through all 15, 16 weekends of riding and everyone is so lovely. And it's a real team effort at GCT. It's everyone is trying to do the best and yeah I honestly I walked in and it's quite scary walking into a new team that have been together for a while and instantly they made me feel part of the team so yeah it's, it's the coolest job I have because they have their is it they have their own streaming service yeah or? they have their own GCTV 
Um, clever, live, yes, very, live clever, very smart. Clever. Um, <laughs> although there are so many of these like LGCT and then you've got the GCL and then the GCT. Yeah. There are too many. Um, so I let Mark, the main presenter, kind of deal with the logistics and I just chat to the riders. It's just I have the best job. I'm often the reporter. I get to go out and see behind the scenes, chat to the riders. I mean, at Burley this year and last year, I was told to stand at the start finish of the cross country, watch everyone go around on a monitor and then interview your heroes at the end. Wow. And yeah, I just looked perfect. at them and I went, do you know how much money I'd actually pay to do this? Yeah, yeah exactly. And you're paying me? Cool. Makes no sense. <laughs> no. Do you feel there's um, pressure on your shoulders to present these riders in the right manner? There's definitely pressure not to annoy them. I'm very wary that as media, we can be quite, we don't mean to be annoying, but it is part of our job to get the interviews. Um, I actually spoke to Oliver Townend about it and I said, you know, I know, I know it's a bit frustrating. Like you've just won and you have to come over and chat to us. He said, no, no, no. When we're at the top level of sport, you know that this is part of it. It's what it comes with. And it, it comes with the game. And also without media, people don't know about you. People don't know that you've won Burley. It's, it's not as big a thing. You know, there are so many sports that could just go ahead and no one actually knows what's going on and then sponsors don't get in there. So I do think we're really important, but I'm also very wary not to upset riders, particularly with the show jumping, because it's new to me. You know, I don't want to upset riders. If they've had a bad round, I just look at them and I go, any chance for an interview? And if they say no, I'm like, don't worry, I'm not going to push it for now. Until they start getting to know me, then I'm not pushing things. But I'm also very... Um, wary that if I say to someone, you know, Frankie de Tori is often wanting to be interviewed by 10 people. So, and I know if he's got a ride in the next, I'll just say to him, Frankie, one question. And I will then only ask one question. And then he will probably answer 10 of my questions in one because he's a pro. But I just try and honour what I say to people. So if I say, I promise this is 30 seconds, I'll make it 30 seconds. Um, Because all those people get cross. So a lot of it, like you say, is building partnership with the riders, isn't it? Yeah, massively. So you have to build up the trust with people, build a friendship with people. And then they realise that media is not a nasty thing. But, you know, it is part of the job to be interviewed and talk about it. Some of them love it. Some of them hate it. But it's just part of the job. Is it the ones that are a little bit reluctant to it? Are they more the old school people? Yeah, they, yeah, some of them are. I think, do you know what, it totally depends on the day as well. You know, we always say this, you meet your favourite celebrity or something and then they've, they've had a really bad day. You go away and think, oh, they're not very nice. I don't like them. They've got a bad rep. But they may have just had a really bad day. And I think it's the same with some, I have one of the riders, which I won't name, um, completely ignored me day one, even though he'd gone double clear. And he then came up to me at the end of the day and said, I'm so sorry. I was just totally in my head that day and I, I really apologise for ignoring you. The next day he had a terrible day and he jumped off his horse and came straight to me before I even asked. So it's that thing of actually just going, don't worry, no stress. You know, you can come over if you can. But he did apologise and I said, you know, I was like, oh, that's very kind, thank you. Um, but everyone everyone has their bad days and good days and I think you just need to be really wary of that as a presenter and also knowing what's important and what's not important. Like, is that interview worth getting or is it worth leaving them for another day when we actually will need them? Yeah, we've touched a lot on like the positive side of things regarding being a journalist in that aspect. What are some of the times that you've had to have difficult conversations with either riders or an uh, and interviewee in that in that regards? Do you know? I think I'm quite lucky that so far I've had it quite easy um, with riders and. And stuff like that. I don't think I, I'm trying to think if I've had to have a really awkward conversation with any of them. I don't know if I have. Um, some of them can be quite grumpy and you just have to sort of let them, when they give you a one word answer, you're like, okay, goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's leave I you alone. I know this isn't going Yeah, anywhere. I know this is not going nowhere. Um, no, I think I've been very lucky so far that they've all been reasonably nice to me. And But I tend to just... I tend to just try and keep it on a human level instead of a presenter versus an interviewee. But like you guys, you know, it's yeah. just a chat. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I say to them, and if you can't do the chat, then don't worry about it because yeah. I'll grab you another time. That's, I don't know if 
people might be listening being like no we don't like her but I think at the moment I'm just trying to build a relationship with everyone and make sure that everything we do is fun and and easy and that doesn't come overnight that 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 relationship building just comes with time yeah I'm sure people laughed at me as well in the beginning I laughed at myself because I knew nothing about racing and you know I'm saying to some of the riders wow I knew nothing about no, horses exactly. I'm doing. <laughs> it's like you go to them and you go wow what an amazing race and they're like was it it was just like a handicap race that with 20 of us it's not a big deal so I've just had to really learn what is right and what's wrong to be excited over mm. and let them be excited rather than me be excited that's probably the hardest thing for someone who's looking at you potentially listening to this podcast what would you say if they want to sort of get into the presenting side of things especially in the equestrian world because I believe from an outsider's perspective it's quite a lack of representation for equestrian presenters. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's the world's hardest question. I asked everyone that question when I was younger. I met Claire Balding at school, and I said, "I want to be a presenter." She was just like, "There's no route in. There's no normal route into presenting." I was, I fell into it. I would just say, "Tell everyone that you're going to be a presenter one day. Don't say I want to be. Say I'm going. I'm going to be one one day." I think. It probably helps getting a YouTube channel. You don't have to post anything, but just start filming yourself, start learning how to be in front of the camera, start learning some skills, go on media courses. And yeah, just tell everyone because you have no idea who might need a presenter. I was very lucky that day at Ascot that she overheard me Mm. and thought, oh, brilliant, I need a presenter. And then just work really hard at it. Nothing is going to come to you just on a silver plate. You have to work hard for it. And I think on Instagram social media again it can look really easy yeah. and actually and just like oh well someone said to me the other day you're flying at the moment I thought well yeah I'm very lucky work's going really really well but it's I have worked hard to get there and I do yeah. every day work on it as well I mean when I was at uni I used to be put an earpiece in in my lectures so I could try and listen to the lecture and something going on in my ear and just I just wanted to be a presenter so I was like I need to learn but it was nothing about wanting to be known if I'm um, opposite to be honest but I love the secrets of TV so I love knowing how something's made I think that's why I enjoyed the modeling industry to an extent because I'd see a picture and I go well I know how that was made you know the Miami ones in particular Still going one click yeah everyone's down. gone oh there's a white wall and I'm like yeah but what I saw I actually was going to do a book which I've never done um I can see you releasing a book well, I was going to do one called what you see what I see so strong yeah like with that. modeling because I thought I see 10 people staring at me, one person looking at the monitor, pointing, photographer taking a picture. And then in Miami, um, my background was like naked men on the beach in Miami. (laughs) And they're back. You're just seeing a white wall. But what I'm seeing is 10 crew staring at you, pointing at you in a funny way. Um, I've got a brilliant one of Bruce Weber shooting Ralph Lauren. There's like a dog. There's like 20 people in the crew. But what you see is just like three of us sat at a table in a cafe. What I'm seeing is this whole New York scene. Yeah. So I don't have enough pictures to release it. But at one point I did think you got, no one sees what I see. I feel like that yeah. could be a good storybook though. I feel like could there's be. definitely like Yeah, a... what you see, what I see. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. It is, But it's social media as well, isn't yeah. it? You're yeah. seeing this picture of me like presenting. But what I'm seeing is... Yeah. The, all the stress, all the we research. We talk about and... social media like that all the time. It is that, it's that mirror, in it? It's people don't see what's behind the glass wall. How do you guys cope with... Do you get negative comments? Do you have... How do you cope with that? Um, do, you, <laughs> do you know what, actually? Um, not so much anymore we get as much as we used to. Yeah. Um, we I, When we do get them now... I, I per, it, sometimes it personally makes my day, but I, well, I think we're, we're not like the normal person. So I'm not saying it's easy to adapt to that mentality. And it definitely wasn't like that to start with. Um, but our content has massively changed in the last yeah. five, six months. And it's taken us that time to change people's opinion Opinions. of us. And that has, it has been hard. Graft. Does that not frustrate you that you've had to do that though? Well, to change our yeah. content, mm. uh, no, I think we it, it came to a natural sort of head where mm. we we knew that that's what we needed to do because we weren't we just weren't enjoying making that content anymore, yeah. and whereas I think at the beginning we enjoyed sort of a little bit of recognition from that, then it was it was it was a glass ceiling. Yeah. It, when it was the same recognition, it was like. 
but we're more than that. Yeah, I, I'm more than doing putting a wig on and doing a comedy skit, and and we have. That's more the thing to you offer. fall into a trap, don't you? Quite quickly. Yeah, that's why I always wanted to be like I'm more than just a model. I'm not, and I always used to say to people, I'm not a model. My job is a model, but I'm just a country mm. girl who's at school trying to do GCSEs. Mm. But my job is to do that. I hated being called a model. I was like, no, no. And even now, I'm like, don't mm. call me that. <laughs> you get perceived as one dimensional very yeah, quickly. Yeah, massively. Um, and people are very, very quick to make an assumption of you, um, which it's always been difficult. Even now, the way that my tattoos, people yeah, instantly, people especially as that. a dressage rider, you don't put two and two together. Whereas for me, they are stories for me. Yeah. And... Um, and why should that matter? Exactly. Absolutely. But for a lot of people, straight away, they'll see a hand around my neck and be like, oh my God, yeah, what on earth? He's got bleach blonde hair. It's just so, uh, I don't know, unique. Uh, well, someone described me as original, so <laughs> I'm quite different. I think in, that's a good in, thing. Yeah, though. absolutely. I would, I would describe him as Dennis Rodman. It's- <laughs> <laughs> that, that is my who I compare. Do you know what? That's way more fun to be original. Yeah. I was never the girl at school that had like a group of friends I just floated between everyone mm. and I was always the weird one I still am the weird one even my fiance admitted to me that when he first met me he did go away and think god she is really weird <laughs> <laughs> and didn't know whether he could cope with the relationship <laughs> he was like yeah I did, did go away from that one date and think yeah she's she's on another level <laughs> it's because you had coffee that morning probably yeah. had coffee yeah <laughs> Um, but yeah, I just think it's way more fun to be weird. Yes, it's way more yeah. fun to be a bit more different. And yeah, you don't have to have like 20 amazing friends. Have two really good friends yeah. that you love to bits and you can rely on who are also just a bit weird. <laughs> I just think yeah. it's... And I think people people probably see me and they see me in pretty dresses and hats at Ascot and think, oh, she's this, you know, girl that's put on a proper dress and she looks perfect. Very prim and proper. Very prim and proper, proper, you know. And actually, then I will start telling certain stories, which I absolutely cannot tell on a podcast. And everyone oh, goes, it, no, I can't, I can't. <laughs> there are just some really good stories. Um, yeah, there are some stories. And I'll start telling them. Everyone goes, oh, you're not really that girl that we yeah. thought you are. And I'm like, yeah. And I think I purposely now tell some highly disgusting stories just, just to, to, just to, make, to set yeah, the just tone. to set the tone to almost well, humanise yourself to a certain extent yeah exactly what's the one story that you could say on a podcast <gasps> where, where, I don't think there on. what's, the, what's the bottom at the low end uh, oh I can't tell it in full but there's one that um, have you heard of the podcast called Shagged Married Annoyed Chris yes. and Rosie Ramsey yes yeah yeah I sent it into their podcast and it's now in their book <laughs> so if anyone listening wants to to see it it's the final page in their book wow uh yes and it is it's it's a story of base am i allowed to swear on this podcast yes, you can, indeed. okay it's a story of shitting yourself but <laughs> we, we love it which has happened too many <laughs> well, why times why does this straight away come back at me <laughs> we've got many videos online of you talking discussing about how that has occurred many times to you. Yeah, yeah it's uh, too many times. Like, now it's getting worried. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what it's I mean? Been, you come into this world shitting yourself, and as you become older... <laughs> it's just not right sometimes. And more incontinent. No, there's oh. just one story. I cannot tell it on here, but there is there are a few stories, and there's one quite recent one as well, that just... Of shitting yourself? Yeah. Okay. Nice. It just shouldn't Amazing. be allowed. Yeah. But <laughs> Do you know what? It's just... <laughs> Honestly... Things the, happen. The worst thing happened to me because I was halfway through a dress arch desk. <gasps> Oh no! <laughs> well, Were you wearing white this is breeches? Be a of this yeah, episode. you can't hide in that, can you? Oh no! <laughs> Sitting trot wasn't fun. Oh no! <laughs> Was it oh. squelching? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, you know how we were just saying oh, no. that we changed our content from the perspective <laughs> of people. Guys, stuff happens, okay? Yeah, and this is and why you can't I help it. You have to laugh about you it. Don't you have to laugh about it. It's just, but I am the most inelegant human that ever existed. I mean, this year at Royal Ascot, I was wearing the most beautiful white couture dress mm. on the first it was day. Stunning, it was a, the yeah. most amazing dress from Susanna, and they are so kind to lend me things. And I put pen on it. 
within the first five minutes of wearing it. My anxiety. It. And all day, everyone was like, oh, you've got pen. And I was like, yes, I'm well aware that there is pen on my dress. Thank you. I just shouldn't be allowed to wear nice things. I just don't. It doesn't work for me. No. I, I mean, yeah. the fact that I'm in jeans right now is also quite something. I'm normally yeah. in leggings and a hoodie, but I have to go to London. So I need to be <laughs> yeah. in my jeans. But <laughs> drive here, didn't you? That's such, to drive here, yeah. It's a long way to go here then. Guys, I'm committed to you. It's you, right. you're, you, Les, make sure you avoid them. That's true. It's very true. Well, I've, I drive halfway in and then I cycle. Cycle you are rest. very um you just looked at like notes there and i but we'll go and i was like <laughs> no I've, I've seen a note because you're very much about um health and well-being and fitness which is really really impressive to watch because um you do a lot of like early morning swims yeah. and stuff like that i love that by the way that's oh, the best fun in the world i can't think of anything worse you, i love health and fitness i'm but, with you you but, say that come on you've i've started getting you into cold water now yeah, no, the one thing do for me... Do you do cold water as well? So I've got I've, my Lumi, <gasps> Lumi pod downstairs. Yeah, we're do gonna, you have one? I've, got, yeah. I've actually got two. <laughs> oh, that's so we're cool. We're going to go for an ice bath after this. It's a great shout. Um, and I, I love the health and well-being. What I refer to is what I can't stand is I have not... A, well, it's a... I guess a phobia of water. Okay. But when I see you going into lakes, I'm Ethic. like... Ugh. No, it's the best fun. I just... Oh, I don't, I don't. I think it's something about being on top of the water and then it's not, better than being underneath. <laughs> see, I disagree. I've done, which is really what? against it. I've done scuba diving. Oh, I can't. And my anxiety was calmer. Than, really, knowing yeah. that you could just drown straight away. Well, I, but the thing is, I think for me, it's more like the not knowing what is about. Yeah, true. Um, so I can't see it, especially out in the sea when you've got like that turbulent of... Uh, yeah, that is quite scary. You feel really small. I agree Whereas with that. Whereas when you're underwater, you have that, it's a little bit calmer, so you don't have as much of a current. Um, and you sort of have a bigger, vast understanding of what you're Maybe you should are. have been a fish. <laughs> <laughs> Rosie. Well, if you like being under the water, maybe no, you should have well, been a fish. I wouldn't do it now. I think as I've got a little bit older, I've I've sort of have more of a value yeah. of life. And, uh, yeah, I can understand the sea because you wouldn't catch me. Yeah, you there. can understand the sea, but you don't lakes, know what's in that. lakes are fine. Oh, like no shark's are... going to eat me in a lake. No, and if it does, then it's. We do have those news. little teeny tiny fish that you know the ones that eat your feet. Oh, piranhas. Yeah, no, no, no. The little teeny tiny. What? No oh, piranhas. Fuck, <laughs> Not piranhas. piranhas. No, the little teeny tiny fish that are like the size of like this like really tiny you get oh, you put like your feet you'll be you actually put, your feet, to put your feet in them yeah yeah so in our river we've got quite a few of those so if it makes you get in quicker because i hate it when i can feel them so i'll stand there and i'll be like okay breathe get into the cold river and then they start getting to my feet so i'm like i just need to jump in are they not in the colder part of the are they just at like the surface yeah they're realize... basically they're really shallow right, um, there's okay. we've got two we're very lucky we've just moved so we're now out in the country again mm. and uh one part of the river is 50 meters from the house and wow. it's a more like an ice but you can't swim but you can sit and sort of float and then there's another one 15 minute walk away that we can you can swim against the current and do a proper swim so why do you do that. do that um i love feeling fit i need to feel fit i don't think i'm a nice person if i haven't exercised um <laughs> rossi my fiance would definitely say that and I think mental health wise, it just, you feel really good. Yesterday I had a day where I went for a run. I went for a 40 minute walk. I went for a 20 minute swim. And then I went for an hour and a half walk in the evening, which is overload exercise day, but I had the day off and I just felt amazing. You sleep better. You feel better. You, it's nothing to do with what you look like. It's nothing to do with wanting to be a certain weight. It's more just you feel really good. Particularly, there's a really horrible hill near us. And if I can get all the way to the top, I feel fantastic. <laughs> good day. A really good day. <laughs> Although my heart rate did get to 194 yesterday going up the hill. Don't Bloody know if that's hell. a good thing or not. But um, yeah, I just need exercise. I really need to exercise. Do you think that helps get you in the right mindset for when you are interviewing guests 100% 100% I try my best to go for a run in the morning if I'm working it depends obviously it depends what time I just try and do something even if it's 10 sit-ups or stretch or just I have to be active I just love it and I you know I was house sitting at home for mum and dad last week and um you know you could say my one week off I would have loved to have got up at like 10 o'clock in the morning I can't do that my body clock wakes me up at six hmm. and then I'm up and I want to get the horses in I want to walk the dogs I want to just like to be moving. I can't deal with a day sat. I'm not good at it. I'll be in a real crump. I <laughs> it's like having to go to London you. today. I hate London. So. I can see you doing like a full like fitness session before your wedding day. Uh, on your wedding day. Oh, that's the plan. 
So yeah. what, what is the plan? So congratulations, Thank you're you engaged. Thank you. you. The weird girl has has been proposed to. <laughs> she's found to, someone. She's found <laughs> who's someone. just as weird. <laughs> uh, because your partner's also very is into his fitness as well. Yeah, so he's um he's an adventurer with his identical twin brother, the Turner twins. Uh, they're actually away at the moment until December and then gone again until May. So they're on a big trip at the moment. Which they is... like the identical bear grills. Yeah effectively makes sense yeah that's how to describe them everyone always says how do you describe them i think well think bear grills and think two of them um, <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah they are really into their fitness they often do because they're genetically identical they can do proper sort of um experiments so one lifted weights for three months whereas the other one just did body weights and then they tested how fit they were and it was really interesting one went vegan one went normal i say normal just you know, mainstream, eat, mainstream mm-hmm. eating everything yeah. and they did proper blood tests they work with the uh, hospital and they do proper sort of tests as well so they're genetically identical they look identical so they can do some really epic testing yeah and i think it's really interesting what they do i um, never thought about it like that actually. no yeah. i was really thrilled my one did not go vegan because i don't know <laughs> if i would have coped <laughs> um, what was he was the really grumpy in that? um that the results were, as far as I can remember, I'd need to remember to listen to them, um, that the one who went vegan, the cholesterol went way down. So that was really good. But his gut had very little bacteria in it, which is really bad because the more bacteria you know obviously you don't want too much but the more gut bacteria you have i'm not a doctor by the way um the more you can fight off diseases and colds and everything like that because you need it in your gut so he didn't mm. have as much gut ba- gut bacteria anymore um and yeah i think that was that was the main results i think everything leads to have a healthy balanced diet you don't yeah. have to eat meat you don't have to eat it all the time but i think every experiment they've done has led to just keep everything in moderation. And I mean, I've done every diet under the sun and I will say that don't ever cut out the food group. Just eat everything, mm. eat less of it and exercise more. It's yeah. really simple. Everyone tries to make it, it, com- it complicated. It's just because everyone wants a quick fix, right? Mm. Everyone thinks I want to get fit by tomorrow. So if I go to 10 exercises classes today and not eat anything, I'll surely have a six pack and be fit by tomorrow. Yeah. That's not how it works. You have to work at it all the time it's consistency and longevity even if it's 10 minutes you know i Mm. went for a run the other day before burley um and i did i did five minutes out five minutes back super easy absolutely nothing but those 10 minutes of just getting me up and out and a bit of a sweat the rest of the day felt great same with cold water cold water you can't beat yeah i look i'm only just getting into cold water but um, when you get into it you won't look back i hated it before it's so weird because when we did it last week we were filming the podcast and we i had a really bit of a shit day and before the start of the podcast i said to josh i was like felt so my anxiety had gone completely it was just weird because people look at me and don't think i'm a very anxious person but no. i also am and then after that i felt so yeah so calm it's your breathing none of us breathe mm. it's a weird one until you we get in breathe. and you go <gasps> we're all mouth breathers <laughs> yeah we are it's awful so you get into water and you just i've now got it down to a t i used to take 10 minutes to get in now i take three breaths and you just have to, on your last breath, I, as you breathe out, you go in mm. and there's no looking back. And it gets easier. But now it's getting colder each time as well. Yeah, <laughs> so time of year. Yeah. Time of year is not great. <laughs> but it's great. It's good for you. It's good for your muscles. It's good for your breath. It's good for the mental side of it as well. I just, I used to have a phobia of staying cold because I, in modeling, you shoot winter in the summer and summer of in the course. winter. So you're often freezing or overheating and I'd never warm up and that was my phobia is not warming up and then I was meant to swim the channel for charity and COVID sadly stopped that wow um so I had to learn how to deal with being cold so a friend has a house near the sea so I ran a bath in her house went out got cold tried to warm up without the bath but mentally knowing that it was there meant that I had no fear of getting cold and then I just learned how to get warm without needing the bath it is absolutely crazy the power of the mind though isn't it Epic. like i actually saw a study recently and they took uh three bodybuilders over a two-week period and they didn't lift in that time but they visualized lifting and their muscle mass went up 13 percent. no yeah and really? i was just touched on why about the bath would have worked yeah. wow that's amazing isn't it it's crazy yeah when the you mind think, is mad yeah so i've been to the gym mentally 17 times already this week and you can see the results mm, thank you. <laughs> you really thank you. can really i might mentally do that every day actually i might mentally run a 10k every day yeah. <laughs> yeah. see what happens easy easy but, yeah it's good i don't know what you guys find but and also it makes you fitter on a horse 
I don't know. Mm, like, yeah. I love riding. We but... talk um, quite a bit to uh, riders about, like, rider fitness and, like, what what um, the development. And I feel like the industry is sort of starting to come quite distant in promoting it for, especially top-end riders. Yeah. Well, it's slightly different between, like, sort of your background with racing to, I guess, show jumping and, uh, and eventing because in racing, they abuse themselves to hit weight really yeah they i don't they, understand they how jockeys do it actually they are the fittest fittest athletes that there are yeah. and well in my mind and they are the smallest and they don't feel themselves well they do but they can't feel themselves properly because they need to be a certain weight it's a whole you know it's a whole big thing in the industry i was you know i used to event for fun i used to show jump for fun and just you know a classic just go and have some fun but particularly for dressage i don't think anyone realizes how strong you have to be particularly in your legs to be able to keep them still and hold the horse and you're doing a lot more than just sitting there um so the stronger i get the better my horse goes mm. because i can ride him properly yeah, and you do less and you do less because of it yeah mm. exactly what do you think um that is, if there's any long-term effects on like for the jockey inside I don't feel like it's as healthy to be that lean all the time, cutting weight. Some of the things you have to do to be able to cut weight. What would like the long, some of the long term effects be of having to do that for such a period of time? Do you know, I can't speak in terms of a jockey because I've only done a couple of charity races where I, the heaviest we were allowed to be was thirteen stone, and luckily I'm not close to thirteen mm. stone, so I just ate and enjoyed it. Um, I think they are extreme athletes who I have a ridiculous amount of respect for them in what they do and how they kind of carry on and then chat to us and, and they're actually yeah. <laughs> okay to chat to us because I think if I, I remember when I was starving well not starving myself but I was not eating as much when I was a model I was so grumpy all the time um but you know I know from my own experience that you you do have long-term effects from not fueling yourself properly and not being healthy and you know I've I get tummy problems and I get all these sorts of things because you just haven't eaten properly mm. i just think it's it goes back to the who cares attitude if you are younger and listening to this just stop caring and eat what you need to eat fuel yourself properly your brain will work better you will work better you'll have better days i still have times where you know now we are getting married i tried on my wedding dress bought my wedding dress um and you know instantly you just get nervous and excited and you think oh you know want to make sure i look good and then instantly i was like stop doing that just eat enjoy You'll yeah. look fine. It doesn't matter. So, yeah, I think long-term effects, probably mentally as well, but physically I'm sure there are really... Probably like quick fatigue. Yeah, probably thought. as well. But, that you know, it's a lifestyle and hopefully a lot of them have figured out a healthy way to do it. Um, lots of them are a lot shorter and therefore they can... They are lighter anyway. Um, but, you know, I definitely can't speak on behalf of a jockey apart from the fact that the respect I have for them is it's absolutely insane. Yeah, it's insane. How... Over the time that you've been presenting, have you maintained sort of the passion and love for what you do? Um, the adrenaline of being on camera. You just can't beat it. You absolutely can't beat the count in your ear when they're going five, four, three, two, one, cue to you. And you think, oh God, I don't ever remember anything I'm going to say. Mm. Uh, the adrenaline is unbelievable. And it really is every job that comes through at the moment is another dream job coming through. So I just spend my whole time thinking, oh, I'm so lucky so yeah. lucky to get to do it and you know i got to work with claire balding this year and last year um well alongside her she does the bbc for burley we do burley tv we're in the same sort of area and that to me is just watching a, like a real veteran at work literally like, wow. just sit there going wow i wanted to be you when i was like five or six i did tell her that she, didn't, she wasn't thrilled about <laughs> yeah. how long i'd been watching her for <laughs> um, but she is and then you know she is probably the nicest kindest person i've ever met in my life yeah. and i just thought brilliant because if you had been an arsehole i would have been yeah. really upset yeah, yeah, cool. um, she, she grew up around horses yeah she grew up around her horses her dad was a trainer her brother's now a trainer so she massively grew up in the racing world yeah. um so she's an absolute horsey horse mad woman as well so podcast with claire boarding's coming soon 100 percent. 100 percent. well i'll i'll our damn Claire. Yeah, that's a good plan. <laughs> See how we go on for. <laughs> is it, um, you, you're fully booked up now, sort of like, because that's quite a difficult part to get to, is going from, and I I can understand from that in perspective, you, they always say, don't they, you do one job 
and you need to make sure you've booked your net job before you finish this one. Yeah. Um, and I imagine presenting is a little bit similar to that. It's because you're freelance to a certain extent. Yeah, you're just yeah. going, right, where, where is that work? 100%. That's where my manager is amazing because um, I think we've been very lucky that I'm still very early on in my career that at the moment when I do a job, another one tends to come out of that job. Um, so I think I've been very lucky at the moment. But yeah, it is that worry that I think it's more at the end of a year when people haven't set their budgets and people haven't set their presenters yet. And then you're going, oh God, I have nothing in the year. But then Liz will email everyone and go, hey guys, just checking, what's the plan? And then every job will come back through and I go, phew, okay, my year's good. It's yeah. fine. You can relax now. Yeah, I'm like, I can chill. Yeah. Um, so, you know, same with the Longing Global Champs. It's epic that next year I know that not, nothing's been confirmed yet, but I know that there are a certain amount of dates in the diary and um, obviously you've got the wedding to look forward to as well and, yeah, next next year's already looking really busy, which is great. But I never take I never take anything for granted, but also I'm very wary that it might not work, it might work and I'm just going with the flow of it at the moment and see if it works then brilliant. If it doesn't then I'll have babies and be a housewife. <laughs> nice. Nice like that. What, what's the um what's your goal? What where's the fu- what's the future hold for Rosie Tapner? Um, such a good question. Do you know what? I'm in a real dilemma about that at the moment? Um, I just, I think I'm just going to see where it goes and hope that it carries on because I'm loving every single second of it. I'd love to get, like, keep going, keep getting further and keep improving is my main thing. I'm quite critical of myself every job that I do. I'll go away and think, oh, that was awful. You know, I I will send stuff to Ed Chamberlain and say, can you watch it and critique me Mm -hmm. and just give me two points I need to work on. Um, and so I just, I want to get better. And I want to improve and then just see see where it goes, really. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. What an amazing way to end this podcast. Guys, thank you. That was oh, awesome. Thank you so much for coming Also, your on. sofa is worryingly comfortable. <laughs> I know. I might never leave. She's really set yourself into it. Um, everyone, thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. It's the same stuff we say every episode. Really should put little bits in between to do yeah, all Yeah, absolutely. Make sure you're sharing the clips. And thank you to everyone for all your support so far on this journey. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. We'll do this again, Rosie. Yeah, hundred percent. When you do your your the the big big next thing, we'll yeah. have you back we'll on. You be like, what's my ne- big next thing? What job are you giving me? Uh, only time will tell. Oh, that's the we're dream. in competition with you for this. <gasps> Ooh, yeah, who's going to go to the Olympics? Yeah, we keep telling everyone that we're trying to get. I think it's so really. I'm think, manifesting it too. Yeah, I think you've got more chance. Than we have. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, thank you for listening to Reddit in uh, Rosie Tapley. You can find her all on social media. Very, very simply. Anything else you want to add, Rosie? No, just thanks, guys. That was epic. And peace. We'll see you on the next one. Bye. Oh, lovely. You guys are so good at this. Oh.